Here. Commissioner Stevens. Present. And Commissioner Perry. Present. Okay, next order of business is public comment that does not pertain to the item on the agenda. Is there anybody that has a comment? Um, okay. Yeah, Steve Skinner, 2310 Lombard, North Bend. Um, I noticed after Coos Bay Village got all done that there's basically, this doesn't directly pertain to you any longer. It's moved out of your jurisdiction, but I'm hoping maybe you can write a letter to council and the developer. Uh, there's a, no real good emergency egress out of there to the north end. Um, all that area, 101, the tracks, the village are all built on fill. So we can assume in a Cascadia subduction event and with consequent tsunami uh, that there's going to be subsidence and uplift and God knows what will happen there. There's a 50% chance, 30 to 50% chance that that will happen during business hours of some type, daytime. Could happen in the summer when there's a lot of tourists in there. When that place is full, there's several hundred people in there. There's probably a couple hundred cars. If something happens to that intersection at Hemlock and they can't get across there, the only other way they can get out now is to go south to the museum to try to get to high ground that presents its own set of obstacles because who knows what's going to happen there and it's not exactly easy to get from the museum to the high ground you got to wind yourself around and i assume wires might be down i mean who knows what's going to happen so on the north end i noticed there is a um a railway track official crossing on the coast guard property it's already there it's in the unused part of the Coast Guard property, and it's about 30 feet off the end of the development. And the way they designed it on the development side, there's kind of a walkway, and the road kind of swoops up and around, maybe about three feet off the ground. But if they remove some of the curbing and built a ramp, they could hit that crossing with about 30 feet of, of roadway. It would have to be designed for emergency exit only, whatever entail, that would entail. Um, but it would give everybody on the north end at least a shot at getting out of there and getting to high ground. So I'm just kind of bringing that up and I'm hoping that you can uh, pass it along to the appropriate parties. And maybe um, it's time to uh, look at future zoning issues and codes to address that kind of a situation because I don't think we really, we, I mean the Bay Area doesn't really have a lot of that stuff at this point other than the evacuation route signs that most of us don't even see anymore. <laughs> um, there's not a lot out there and that's maybe it's time we started looking at some of that kind of thing. So down the line, so anyway. That's really all I have to say, unless anybody has any questions. So I did speak to the fire chief about three months ago. He was going to talk to the developer. I don't know if he did or not. And I mentioned it to Jim, and he was not here tonight, but he just said I should come in and talk. And I talked to Chelsea, and she said, well, it's not. You've already passed on it, but uh, I still wanted to address you guys because it does come under your purview um, down the line. And you could write to the developer even if it's in retrospect. And I know at one time that area so. was designated as a dog park area. Yeah. It's supposed to be lawn moving there, and that's just never happened. Um, but that was, that's still worked fine. Okay. I mean, it wouldn't be very expensive to do. So move some, some curbing and, and construct a 30-foot rampway, and you're right there at the tracks. So it gives everybody a pretty good shot. So, okay. Yep. You. you bet. Okay, 
Yes, so the city recently, really, we are tonight, today, kicking off the city's Empire Area Blueprint um, project, looking at how we can, um, what we can do to help revitalize the Empire Area, same as what the city did with the Front Street um, Blueprint. We have our consultant online with us tonight, David Evans and Associates, and they are going to present to us um, give us an introduction on the project, kind of go over some existing conditions, and then open it up for discussion. So I'll turn it over to Jim. Okay. Good evening. Can you, can you folks hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. I, I noticed um, when, when I heard people speaking into the microphone. It was very loud and clear on my end, but if you're sitting back away from your microphone, it's very hard to hear you. So just, just heads up. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for having us. Um, we're really excited about the Empire Area Blueprint, and we really enjoyed working on the Front Street Blueprint. Jim Henke from David Evans. I'm the consultant team project manager. And I have Natalie Warner here with me, who is leading our public engagement team. Do you want to introduce yourself, Natalie? Yeah, hi, I'm Natalie Warner. As Jim said, I'm leading the public engagement team for the project and really excited to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. What I'd like to do, uh, we had a meeting earlier today with the advisory committee, and we're just getting started. So. I, we've, I want to give an overview of the effort and then share some of the data gathering that we've performed. And there's quite a bit of content, so I'll move quickly to allow time for you to you know, ask questions and we can go back and look at slides as much as you like. But it is a fair amount of content, uh, but it'll, it'll at least get you oriented to the people and the process and where, where we're starting with our fact finding right here at the beginning. So, Chelsea, I'm going to share my screen if that's all right. Absolutely, you should be able to do so. Great, let me hit the share screen button. How's that? Perfect, we can see you, see the screen. Okay, great. Uh, so a brief overview, people involved, the purpose of the project and our process, and then a number of maps primarily that identify the study area, some of the policies we've gathered and are reviewing, and then existing conditions related to land use and some transportation analysis sort of uh, as a beginning point. And then as much discussion as you like, Chelsea and Jennifer are working with us as our as a city partners there to help uh, provide oversight. Natalie and I at David Evans are joined by Gigi Cooper, who is a certified planner, and Angela Rogi, who is a transportation specialist, and she's done some transportation system planning in the Coos Bay area recently. Partnered on our team is Eco Northwest. They are market real estate and implementation experts. Cadence, Emily, and Mary, uh, you'll see them later in the process, but they'll be advising about how we might be strategic in finding funding or what pieces of plan might catalyze other pieces of plan. The advisory committee uh, earlier today, this is a list of the folks involved. Uh, I won't read all the names unless, Chelsea, do you think I need to? I don't think you need to read them, no. Okay. We're going to have advisory committee meetings throughout the process to help inform the technical and policy elements. Um, Natalie, 
Do you want to speak to a bit of the engagement, uh, or would you prefer I just keep rolling? Um, I, I either way, I can <laughs> either way. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'll, 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 I'll just go, and, and if you have a few extra points you want to make, jump in. Um, we're going to interview some stakeholders, and I'll show you that list of who we have um, on our list right now. So there'll be four public meetings, a couple of planning commission meetings. We hope to have a planning commission public hearing towards the end of the process, and if all goes well, we will have a, a city council public hearing where we're hoping the plan will be adopted. There's some media releases and flyers that we'll be helping prepare, and the project website there's a, a link and address at the bottom of this slide that uh, if you haven't visited yet, you know, please go check that out. It's where we will be posting documents produced throughout the process and there'll be a variety of resources where people can um, learn about it and engage with it, provide comments. How'd I do, Natalie? You did great, Jim, thank you. <laughs> okay. I'll keep going. Uh, the stakeholders that we're going to interview, uh, let's see, there's about 12 of them, I believe, or this is, uh, Chelsea, you had mentioned it, it seems like you helped develop this list. It was a good balance of local um, business owners and others who really know the area. Correct. Okay. Broadly, the purpose of this project is to address the study area's vision and transportation needs with recommendations regarding development and circulation management. A classic land use transportation project is really um, what we're trying to clarify the vision and actions related to what people would like to see happen in the area. Specifically, there are seven objectives, and I will read these just so, because um, I think they're clarified. Number one, we want to build on the previous transportation planning work, specifically the Empire Urban Renewal Plan, the Hollering Place Master Plan, and the Transportation System Plan. Number two, definitely want to actively engage with the community and property owners. Um, get their input, hopefully generate some support, and have them, you know, help us craft the strategies for improvement. There's going to be uh, the need, number three, to clarify the land use and improvement vision as we move through the process, and specifically those transportation elements such as access and circulation and connectivity. Number four, definitely want to foster a safe and balanced multimodal transportation system with choice to and through the area and address parking and wayfinding uh, as part of all of the transportation pieces. Number five, reflect the historic and cultural significance of the area because there is some history and cultural um, aspects to the area. Number six, Definitely identify environmental concerns, and if we identify some, then recommend mitigation strategies. And then number seven, when we're all done, what are the key policies, code amendments, and funding tools necessary to really advance all of this? So those are the seven objectives that broadly transportation, land use improvement, specifically these seven objectives. We've just kicked off. Here we are in June of 2023. We had an advisory committee meeting earlier today, and we've been busy gathering that baseline information, and, I, and I'll share that shortly. So looking ahead, we want to wrap up our inventory and analysis, and then switch gears into a phase of alternatives exploration. So that starts this summer and will head into the fall. 
Once we understand current conditions, we want to start to play the what if game and develop a couple of scenarios where we can compare and contrast what do people like, what don't they like, which ideas sort of should we move forward. And then further down the road, once we um, get some feedback, we can start to clarify a preferred alternative and then those specific tailored implementation measures to move it forward, wrap it all up into a draft blueprint report and come to you a few times here, you'll see uh, advisory committee and planning commission meetings. And then in May, hopefully is when uh, adoption can occur if all goes well. So that's the schedule and process. Now, now for our research, we've, we've assembled a lot of data. I don't, there won't be a quiz at the end of the meeting here. It, it, I don't expect you to memorize this, but um, I think it'll be informative to, to give you a sense of the ground we're covering. The study area is highlighted here in blue, and it focuses on Newmark Avenue primarily, but the waterfront um, district, I'll call it, along M North Empire as well, is really the focus of our effort. It doesn't mean we're not paying attention to what's outside of the boundary, but at the end of the day, we're going to develop recommendations inside the boundary. Earlier, when we were um, competing to be selected for this work, we put this diagram together, uh, and so I thought I'd include it. It just starts to tease out some of the area context, and we flag that waterfront district, the three-lane narrower section of Newmark, and then where it transitions to a five-lane section as you head east, and then the many uh, existing destinations such as McKay's Market and Cranberry Suites, um, the Devereaux Center, the Y here is a unique condition, and then we understand the city is planning a roundabout uh, at the intersection of Empire and Newmark, and we heard today at the advisory committee that there's also potentially a roundabout being looked at at the intersection of Ocean and Newmark. We know plans have been created for this area over the years. Uh, urban renewal, power in place, transportation system plan. We're reviewing those and no need to reinvent the wheel. We want to take what's good, keep it moving forward, and update anything um, based on this process. Using GIS data, we've put together a lot of maps. And this exhibit shows your comprehensive plan. The, the short story is that uh, our study area is primarily commercial and industrial uses. And it's kind of surrounded to the north and south by a lot of residential. The zoning in the area is very similar to the comp plan. Again, commercial and industrial uses primarily. There's some identified historic resources. Um, the Southern Oregon Company Sawmill is an eligible historic site. And uh, Tower Major Morton House and the Tower Flanagan House are two others. We are looking at natural resources, and there's a number of identified um, wetlands, different classifications of wetlands in the area, and you can kind of see them called out here, primarily along the Coos Bay shoreline, uh, and then there's one up here um, closer to Shoneman and Newmark intersection. <clears throat> We, uh, we looked into flooding in the area, and although this exhibit doesn't really show much, I think the tsunami zone um, 
does tell a story similar to the gentleman earlier in the meeting was talking about in, in the Front Street area. So we want to pay attention to that. And then there's a number of vacant parcels shown in green. And then in yellow are highlighted some areas that um, the current information we have sort of indicates that they perhaps have a higher potential for redevelopment in the near term, but that's something we want to, you know, hear more about and confirm working with all of you. So that, that kind of covers some of the land use topics that we've gathered data on. And now I'm going to go through a series of slides specific to transportation. I mentioned the proposed roundabout at Empire and Newmark. And my understanding is the city already has developed a design and is looking into um, how to actually make it happen. So that's a project that I believe is fairly far along in its development process. Um, I mentioned earlier today, we heard that at Ocean and Newmark, there could be another roundabout. Uh, I, I need to learn more about that. The color coding is all about your functional classification, principal arterial, minor arterial, major collector, minor. Um, a point that Angela Rogi, our transportation expert, made earlier today was that most of this study area is uh, the streets are controlled by the city for the most part, not ODOT. There are a few issues that ODOT um, will have to engage with, such as any traffic signals. But I think, uh, to a large degree, the city can make decisions about the cross-section, and if they want to make changes, then it's within the city's control to do that. There's a number of stop signs, and we've kind of, those little red dots identify where those are, and there's a couple, two traffic signals. And so you can see those here along Newmark Avenue. Driveways are very important to businesses and others. So we've started to identify the locations of where those are. The transit system uh, comes through the study area and there's a few stops here. Earlier today, we heard about uh, the transit provider has received a comment about the Star of Hope stop and someone, you know, kind of requested perhaps decommissioning that stop or moving it. So that that's something we'll be talking more about. We're looking at sidewalks and in red, kind of that red orange on this exhibit uh, is missing sidewalk. So perhaps our alternatives analysis can propose that sidewalks get provided there as one of the solutions. <clears throat> now, there's, there's a concept called pedestrian uh, level of stress. And Angela Rogi, our transportation expert, can explain this better than I can. But basically what you see in red <laughs> means that, based on her analysis, the speed of traffic and the volume of traffic, perhaps, and the sidewalk design creates a condition where pedestrians feel less safe. So the red and the orange is areas where that is occurring, according to the analysis. What's shown in blue and green is where, based on all these factors, pedestrians generally feel better, like it's a safer environment and they can walk around and it's more welcoming. So um, if you want to know more about the details of that analysis, we'll have to get Angela to uh, help answer that question. As you look at bike facilities, this is a de you know, designated as the Oregon Coast Bike Route right here through our study area. But you'll notice these dark green stripes are where bike lanes exist. And you'll notice there's kind of a big gap right here um, along Newmark where there are no lanes. So uh, maybe some, you know, 
we'll have to talk more about that. I guess if you think bicycling is important through this corridor, uh, perhaps there's some ideas about how to make it even better. She, Angela, performed a, a bicycle stress uh, analysis similar to the pedestrian analysis. The orange indicates that there's some concern that cyclists don't feel safe um, along Newmark today, uh, but perhaps on Shoneman and Wasson and, and heading south on Empire, they feel much safer. So uh, just some information to consider as we uh, move forward with this process. She, she summarized her analysis with a few points, and I'll read these quickly. Right now, according to what she's looked at, she believes that the existing roadway network has available capacity to accommodate a reasonable amount of growth uh, due to redevelopment. Depending on future land uses, certain intersections might experience more delay with per vehicle than others. She flagged the intersection of Newark and Ocean as a gateway, but there's some turning movements that I think we'll need to pay attention to. Um, so she's looking at some of the geometries there. And uh, I, my expertise is landscape architecture and urban design, so I think there's some aesthetic treatments as well that could enhance some of the gateway experience of, of these intersections. Safety uh, it is the highest concern for safety today seems to exist at the intersection of Newmark and Ocean and at Shoneman uh, Street. Be that's where the data indicates the highest number of crashes within the study area. These are most commonly rear ends and turning types of um, incidents and there is uh, the data indicates that pedestrians were either directly or indirectly involved in six of these collisions <clears throat> generally speaking there's pretty good connectivity for pedestrians throughout the study area only a few locations where there's missing sidewalk um, that map kind of showed you where the, the higher stress levels are. Uh, she already flagged that buffering pedestrians tends to be the most effective way to improve the level of, you know, that measure of stress. Um, but there's limited comfortable crossings of Newmark at the east end of the study area. Um, so especially where the community, um, the Devereaux Center is. So it sounds like there's a lot of pedestrians in that area, but not very many places where the people can safely cross. So something we'll need to pay attention to. And then somewhat limited bike facilities through the area, particularly on that central part of Newmark. And then um, most of the transit related part of our project we don't have control over the frequency of the buses but i think there's some things about enhancing the pedestrian connection to transit that we perhaps could have a positive impact on so that's the overview um, we have some memos that we're buttoning up and we would like to share with you so that you can review and comment um, the website is something we wanted to make you aware of. And then looking ahead is those alternative designs. So I'll stop there, Chelsea, and um, we can go back and look at slides or answer questions or other comments. Great. So Planning Commission, I think now's the time if you have any questions or Concerns. Is it beyond grateful to the people filling this room at Riverside Hospital as they are wrong in saving his life? Underwear, they're sure, but I don't know.
in that room was the first person who witnessed her and scoring a stroke. Now, this is a situation. There we go. Um, now would be the time to bring up any uh, issues in the area that you're aware of or um, opportunities that you see could come out of this project and also for our public, um, invite them to come up and speak as well. Well, okay. Um, with that said, uh, typically we, <laughs> we have something that we have to vote on. Of course, we're not voting on this. Uh, this is just informational, so there's, uh, there's no for and against. It's just public information. Um, so sure, let's take public comment. Uh, please come and state your name and address and tell us what you think about the, the Empire Blueprint. Try to keep your comments to around three minutes if, if you can. So we'd love to hear from you. Who's going to go first? Hi, my name is David Gieselman. I live on North 14th. And I was looking at that map, and it's north of the hollering point, and it takes in Somar's property, didn't it? Wasn't that Somar's property down there? How do you, how is, how is that in your uh, development when that's their property? Well, of course, this isn't our development. This is just, the, these are the architects. Um, and that was a, that's a very good question. Uh, there's a lot of private property in there, and I, I, I think it's just kind of a, an idea right now because, uh, that would be great if uh, you had some access to that Somar property, especially that old dock. I mean, there's nowhere in town here where anybody can really go fishing, but you could certainly turn that into a wonderful recreational area and a heck of a fishing spot. The part of Coos Bay is completely lacking as far as places to go park and exhibit the, the beautiful nature that we have uh, by the Dairy Queen, Right across from the wastewater treatment plant is another spot you can access the beach. It's just a bumpy old gravel spot. It wouldn't take much to make those 10, 12 uh, paved lots to, to go look and enjoy instead of just crappy little gravel spots. But that, uh, that's the mill trail also. And at the very top of the hill where the trees are growing is, is one of the very few parts of the existing actual mill trail. It's, it's still up there. But uh, yeah, what a great spot if you guys could actually get your fingers down there and, and let, have them help uh, let you access it. That is old empire. In, in Planning Commission, and I'll just add that the sauce Brothers Company, they are a listed stakeholder who's, um, who is willing to interview with our consultant to talk about possibilities of their property. So just FYI. Didn't plan on talking, but <laughs> so totally unprepared, but I have been thinking about the fact that I sit there looking at the empty 400 foot square lower deck hollering place project lot. And since nothing's ever been developed there, it's been fully utilized as a dog park, kites, RC cars and planes. People could do what this fellow wanted to do from that point. The city mows it now under the parks division. And I was hoping under the alternate plans division of this uh, project to talk about maybe making that into the best park in the whole area instead of developing a bunch of buildings. I believe in open space and we have a chance there with city owned property right on the bay. I mean, beautiful except for that old white rusty boat. And uh, so I assume that's in the project too. It's, it's the, I noticed the lines go way out in the water. But yet when we talk about that boat, Oh, we can't do anything. That's that's not our property. But those lines go way out in the water. Anyhow, it could be the nicest, beautiful addition to Empire of any that I've seen, developed, or thought of, which would be making that into a permanent park. It, and oh, the other thing that would be involved there is the fact that it would be overflow for the boat ramp um, two, three times a year. 
that park gets neatly covered with about 30 or 40 pickups and their trailers. Another positive about the park is that currently when dog people are there, kite people, and the homeless people, there's never been an issue. They all get along and there's no reason everybody couldn't use that park. So that was my idea for it. Steve Skinner, 2310 Lombard, North Bend. Um, when I kind of initiated the whole Hollering Place project back in the day, uh, because there was a lack of, my mom ran a B&B &B and the guests were always complaining there was a lack of infrastructure for tourists to pull over and take pictures and everything, which is how we got started. Didn't know it was called the Hollering Place at that point, so all that history came up. And we had a lot of plans, did a lot of work. And one of the things that did come out of that, that there was a huge um, desire to have a lot more access to the water. Uh, and that's the place to do it. Tom addressed some of that, but there's very little in the way of crabbing, clamming, kayaking, all that kind of infrastructure that could be developed along there, even if it's privately owned. Sometimes you can work an access deal with a landowner, all that kind of stuff. So I, I really hope that will be uh, looked at uh, much more in depth in, in this planning. I like the start of this plan so far, it's, it's good. Uh, traveling about 15 years ago in British Isles, we noticed there were huge concrete structures back there, and they were semi-parabolic. It's kind of strange. <clears throat> but what it turned out was these, in 1938, when the Germans were first getting really uh, menacing to England, uh, we only had about a three or four minute or five minute notice be of arriving alien hostile aircraft and there just wasn't enough time. You can't get your airplanes wound up and in the air to defend your country. So they came up with these parabolic systems and that's a fancy word but it's <clears throat> a big curved nest. Some of these were 200 feet wide, 60, 80, 100 feet uh, high and they were like, uh, well, here's a good example. Right now, you can go to a TV set, watch your football game, and you see somebody mumbling into a microphone, and there's this, there's this, uh, this umbrella type looking thing. And its purpose was to be able to, the, the coach over there is saying, hey, do so and so. But enough of that energy could get, if you point, it's, it's mobile, you can point it and say, Okay, so uh, you now have information you didn't have before. And there's uh, what my idea was here at the hollering place, wouldn't it be a great idea to have a, an ear like this? We saw one complete and in fun functioning up in uh, Canada. It was at the... Uh, one of the museums up there, and it was about six foot in diameter. And I, with my family, was up there. And the kids figured out that if one of them stood at that end of the 
building, and another one at the other end of the building. You got to sit in that, sit in that space, and now you can talk back and forth at a modest thing. It, damn, that information is coming through. It's a, all that all the acoustic energy from from a, a para, 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 parabola. Pardon me. Is uh, pretty amazing. So at distance of three or four hundred feet, they could talk to each other because they're standing right in the focal point of this one, and their their uh, brother or sister were down at the other place. So I thought, well, that, and then now the reality of the English use of uh, the, <clears throat> the pardon me, my throat's giving me trouble, and my brain's giving me more. The uh, so this, this uh, parabolic design has, was used up to about 1942, 43, and it was just a godsend to English because they had another, an extra 10 minutes to get off the ground and, and get their planes in combat. Uh, and now here we are, we got, and, and they're still there. It's only been about you know, 80 or 90 years, and, and most of them are still all or partially there, and they were looking out across the, uh, uh, English Channel, trying to find a, an airplane out there, and there were a lot of them. The Battle of Britain was uh, very important on that. So anyway, this acoustic ear is simple. It's got no moving parts, unless you move it with a truck or a crane. Uh, the, my idea was one that's about 10 foot in diameter, and we happen to have possession and, and uh, use of that parabolic master which can be used to make uh, molds which are highly effective. You, you recall the uh, satellite dishes that have been all over the country here for years. Well that's what that was, a highly precise form where they could beam TV signals up and down and we can do the same thing. Just Ours isn't going to be a government project but <clears throat> we thought uh, we could build something like that they're simple. It's uh, just, I, I imagine something about 10 foot tall and about a foot thick steel reinforced concrete. Use stainless steel rebar and uh, uh, put it in the right spot and tweak it to where you got it lined up on this one. And you can put another one on the other side of the <clears throat> channel over there. I think it would be a fantastic attraction where, wow, 5,000 people a day or a week or whatever come by here and say, what in tarnation is that thing? And they stop and say, what? Well, yeah, you can, you can stand on this side and talk to yourself. About, you know, it takes about uh, three or four seconds to the sound to get over there. So you can have your own conversation with yourself. And it, no water power, no uh, electronics, nothing. Maybe make it sturdy as necessary so people can't uh, damage it. There's, who's going to damage two foot thick concrete? <clears throat> you can't even salvage it and break even. So <clears throat> with uh, encouragement, we could put this together in a project. And I can't imagine it's more than a, well, I, I won't put out a number, but it's, it's 10 or 12 foot diameter and a foot thick. And maybe you're looking at 10, 15 tons of concrete reinforced. But that's easy enough. You got a lot of cranes around the harbor here. so you could, set it in place with a swivel base underneath it, probably uh, <clears throat> high density poly, polyethylene or something. So that if you had to, you could tweak it a little bit with the help of a crane and a whatever. But I think it'd be a blast to have it there. You could use it for events. I guess you could have fancy weddings or, or, or you know, Sydney, Australia has got this great big funny looking uh, uh, amphitheater for their concerts and whatnot. It, it would be a real blessing for the community here to, do, to participate in that. But maybe now is the time to start thinking about it because it's, I can't imagine it's going to take more than three or four months to get this thing built and put in place and pointed where you want it. And uh, I, think, uh, I think it was a great idea. It'd be an attraction where people would come in and say, what? Have you seen that thing? Come over there and they can go through the museum or through the history, through the local area. It's just kind of like a spark plant. I, I, I grab me, you know, you grab them and say, hey, look here, look at the, 
the history and the uh, uh, attraction of all this. Wow, because how many of you have ever actually seen one of these things, the big concrete size? No. There's only, you know, 330 million people in the United States, so one or two or three of them must have seen it. But it's uh, <clears throat> something that I'd, I'd like to see, and with encouragement, because I know I'm, I'm really not up for a jousting content with contractors or parole boards or whatever you got to go through. But if it, it struck a nerve, I'd be happy to work with it. And I'm pretty sure we could find resources and support in the community here. <clears throat> That's the other side. <laughs> so really, yeah, somebody on the other side whispers, and you can hear it here. Uh, it's just, just amazing like that. And the gentleman I got this uh, thing from has, has seen, when he was moving it around, it, it, strange things were happening. They were all of a sudden being broadcast when, in this thing as they're moving it around. Anyway, it, it's, it's available, and... Uh, any specific questions? Okay, well, I think it would be an amazing, uplifting thing for the area. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Hi, my name is Fauna Hill. And I actually live in Kilkitch, uh, the Coquel housing um, property, and I work for the Coquel Indian tribe, I'm a Coquel tribal member. And so I have a couple of comments representing the tribe, and then a couple of comments just as someone who accesses this area all the time because of where I live. So from the Coquel Indian tribe, um, two things. One is that I noticed that there's not, uh, well, uh, the Confederated Tribes of Kuslor, Umqua, and Sayusla Indians are called out as a stakeholder. The Kokol Indian Tribe is not called out as a stakeholder. And the Kokol Indian Tribe wasn't on the list either as a special engagement piece where there's um, a conversation, or there's a piece that says in this that you'll have a conversation with the CT Clusi Tribal Council. I think our tribal councils definitely would be interested, um, at least at, at the staff level, um, if not at the council level, in having a conversation. They have a lot of different interests in this area as well. And the other thing is, from their perspective, the purpose language is about reflecting histor the history and the culture of the area. But I would think maybe connecting would be better in the purpose statement. There's a lot of culture in this place that isn't currently highlighted. We just started with that mural, right? There's a mural and there's like a little bit of history in the mural that just got put up in Empire and that's a really beautiful start, but um, this area has very little signage, wayfinding, or storytelling, not just about the early settler history, but the people who were here before that and how much um, those people influenced what this place is today. And I think emphasizing that in both the study area um, options, but also just in the information that you gather and the storytelling about that, I think it would uh, improve the plan quite a bit uh, or make it an a even better plan. Um, and then this is, you know, for me as a person who lives in this area, so um, McKay's is my closest grocery store, the donut shop is my closest donut shop. <laughs> the Chevron is the closest Chevron to me. I think that's, um, you might look at your accidents really being a, a part of the issues, the why and then the location of that Chevron um, and the fact that there's no light there. Um, I don't know, I know ODOT can't do a lot of lights, but when you're doing traffic study, that's a huge point of crossing between the Devereux Center. A lot of the people that are crossing the street not in the place they're supposed to cross is because they're going to the Chevron or the 7-Eleven and that's causing a lot of the issues there. Um, but I would just say that there's not very much wayfinding out there for tourism, and as someone who lives further out towards Charleston, a lot of the traffic that we get, particularly in the summer, is tourist traffic, whether it's bicycle traffic or vehicle traffic, and there's nothing on Newmark that says, like, this way to lots of great recreational opportunities, whether we're talking about Hollering Place or we're talking about further out towards Sunset Bay or Shore Acres. Um, and again, like, nothing that says stop here for information about the clam digging that's been going on since time immemorial to the uh, point the gentleman made about there's really great access to the ocean if you know to park in that one gravel 
spot. <laughs> um, so, so some of that signage and wayfinding and storytelling, I think, could happen along Newmark to help um, people navigate, particularly the bicyclists that are going out that way as well. And then um, I thought it was really interesting that there was nothing in the presentation around uh, resiliency against sea level rise. So we know that Sunset Bay particularly is supposed to get a lot of sea level rise in the next 25 years. I haven't seen what it is for a hollering place, but I would imagine that it's similar. So we saw flood and we saw a tsunami, but we didn't see just like what is the prediction for sea level rise and what would that mean for some different alternatives um, about what happens in that space, particularly as you get closer to Hollering Place, but even as you come up to South Empire Boulevard, I think the consideration of what that might look and be like 50 years from now should be part of the study for the area plan. Thank you. Commissioners, I just want to remind everyone to turn on their mics and speak into the microphone when you speak for those online. Uh, Jim Barron's Fulton Street Coos Bay. Um, I made comments earlier at the earlier meeting um, with um, so you the folks on the the study agency realize what's going on. The biggest single thing that's going to change this is getting willing business partners. They're willing to participate in a revitalization project. We have individual businesses. Uh, Mr. Terry realizes this because he's commented in the past, this one's painted in pretty good shape, and this one's painted in pretty good shape, and this one, why doesn't the city tear it down? <laughs> and some of that tear down stuff um, needs to be exercised. We have a nuisance ordinance on the books. We have vegetation ordinance on the books. Part of this plan needs to be enforcing those ordinances okay um, I'd even go so far as to have a tacky plywood ordinance for this whole town if you're gonna hang plywood up on your broken window you have to paint it <laughs> and that's it um, but I'm very interested in the um, Saucy Brothers property the old mill site um, I'm more optimistic than you are Rex because you're closer to bedrock their pilings are shorter. That's low-rise condominium country, if you can find a willing participant. Um, we have some other pieces of property on Newmark, if you can find a willing participant, that are very possible places for mixed use. Apartments on the top, retail on the bottom. They're big enough lots that can support the parking. Um, and they've been on the market. There's a pretty good sized piece on the market now. And catalysts to encourage that in that corridor, along with slowing the traffic speed down and making it a little bit more pedestrian friendly, okay, and giving it two defini defin defining anchors, 
which would be two traffic circles, might make it some place to go to. That's it for me. No. Does does our consultant have any final words or? Great comments. Um, we've been making notes and um, already kind of got the ideas going in my head. <laughs> so thank you all for participating. Um, again. We showed you the schedule. We're going to keep gathering information and input. And um, a little later, in this, as summer starts to set in, we're going to switch gears and get into alternatives. So um, just really happy to be here and excited about engaging with you to develop the best plan we can. I think it was a good start, though, for sure. I do like the ideas of open spaces. I love the idea of public docks, adding signage for crabbing, fishing, clamming. I always thought it was strange that there was no signage on the way from Newmark to the ocean beaches. You know, people that aren't from here. And um, tie in the history is a great idea. Um, yeah. OK, well. I guess we will close that part of it unless anybody else has something to say. Um, so next is some uh, commissioner comments. Pat? Well, I, uh, as Mr. Barron said, I, I'm glad to see that they at least have the stakeholders and several businesses in there. So I'm curious as what the businesses want and what they really want. Look at one of them right now. Just you know, they're having to deal with things there every day. Um, that's going to be the main issue, I think. And how much, I mean, what is this going to do for them? What is it going to do to revitalize that area? And are they going to, is the city going to do something? I see, I, I was looking at my, I wasn't texting anybody or Facebook or Twitter or whatever people do. I was actually looking at my Onyx Hunt thing to see the ownership there. And I did realize the city got that old gas station or whatever it is on the corner over there. Um, that's probably key to the traffic circle, I imagine, so that's good. But some of those other buildings I'm, that I know that exist on Newmark, I don't know, like Mr. Barron said, the city can be a little more aggressive and community owners to comply. I know there's at least one of those buildings that has some structural issues, um, you know, so hopefully that will resolve somehow through this. I guess that would be all part of it. And then I, I, did, I had two other things that came to mind. It, it slowly came to my mind after our last meeting, which was a long time ago. And that was when we were discussing the fire suppression systems and the VRBOs. And we had a presentation on that. And I came away from that with the understanding that the lady was, in, she was I mean, what was her position? Amy? Amy, she's our building official and fire marshal. Fire marshal, okay. And so I came away with the understanding that it was her unilateral decision to force the VRBO to put the fire suppression systems in. And if we did discuss this in the meeting, I don't remember because it was a long time ago, but I just wonder how many other cities have that same requirement and how we can let one official dictate that relatively significant expense for people who are trying to start a business. I, I think that that's something worth looking into, or at least investing a little bit further. I mean, out of line, because I don't think North Bend does that. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm trying to be like North Bend. Neither does the county. Neither does the county. I just I, I think that if somebody is trying to run a business and trying to do that, of course, and put the fire suppression system into an existing structure, especially an older structure or anything like that, I think that's somewhat impressive. But that's my opinion. And the last thing that I just wanted to say, and this has been, I've been working in this community for over 20 years and I've dealt with a lot of different people. 
and I've heard a common refrain from people involved in the construction trades. And I'm not, I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody or trying to denigrate anybody's job. And some people work in the city of North Bend. But why do I always hear that it's so much easier to get stuff done in North Bend than do stuff? I'm sure that Chelsea's heard the same thing over the years. I, I don't know why, because I ask these guys, a lot of them can't articulate, well, it's easier. How so? I mean, it's not like you don't to stay at Wiener. <laughs> but it, it is the rules, the process, I don't know. <clears throat> I'm just curious as to why that is. Um, but again, those are my comments. That's what I say. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Josh. As far as pro like process goes, permitting, processing? Yeah, as far as kind of the differences, because this came up in it was either the buildable lands inventory or the, something we were doing four or five, six months ago. And, and I think that was something that, that we kind of made a note to, to look at down the road. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, you can just take care of the tracks. Yeah, yeah, just okay. kind of looking at that. I'm sure it is. Like, is there, can we just get a copy of the permitting process and just compare it to our own? I'm sure we can, yes. And I guess the, the only other thing I'd have, and if we can kind of, if we're doing any uh, city parking lots in this Empire Blueprint, but even in general, if we look at, um, uh, like Mr. Skinner spoke about village there, the, the parking lots now are, you know, we're, a lot of our, especially our local traffic is going to be pickups and bigger vehicles, and I know that each parking space has a dollar value to those businesses, and, but man, that's a tight parking lot mm -hmm. in general, and <laughs> is there a way we can look at finding a balance None at this time. Okay, then. 